Miss Wagner is like, yo, uh, MIT version of Gary was pro blockchain, but uh, SEC Gary is anti blockchain. And then Richie Torres is like, yo, is a Pokemon card a security? <laughs> these people are listening <laughs> to crypto it. Twitter. They are oh, like, th these are no, our things. In. They are, we, that the power of crypto Twitter is like getting into Congress. Well, it's because it's distilled logic. I mean. <laughs> Bankless Nation, it is the last Friday of September. David, what time is it? It's the Bankless Friday Weekly Roll-Up, Ryan, where we cover the entire weekly news in crypto, which is always an ambitious endeavor, yet we persevere nonetheless into the frontier this week with a bunch of clips of Gary getting grilled. So oh. everyone, everyone prepare for that one. If you're not listening to this with coffee because it's too late in the day, well, then you should get your popcorn because that <laughs> is what you will need. I, was, I mean, this is a catharsis, I think, yes. for many of you uh -huh. in this episode. You, you'll enjoy this very much. Also, crypto was present in Washington this it's week. It's a one-two punch. Coinbase, yeah, Coinbase's Stand with Crypto Day was held at Capitol Hill the same day that Gensler was giving te testimony in front of Congress. Convenient. What, what about the timing of that? David, Good what timing. else we got? After that, we'll talk about pudgy penguins in Walmart landing a huge deal a ton of distribution for pudgy penguins. Also, with, with each toy purchased having an on-chain identity on ZK Sync. So we'll talk about that. And then after, also, not only are penguins getting identity, but citizens of Buenos Aires perhaps also getting some on-chain presence as well. Uh, we'll talk about that. And then, of course, we're going to do the uh, the PSA of uh, deep fakes and phishing attacks that are out there. We got a Vitalik deep fake that we want to show you. It's pretty hilarious, um, but not if you believe it. Uh, notable notable VC uh, Fred Wilson got fished for uh, 40 NFTs uh, this week. So if Fred Wilson can get fished, so can you. Uh, we will talk about this and more. Uh, what else we got, Ryan? You know, the usual Bitcoin ETF stuff. Uh, ETH might be getting futures. There's a ton to talk about every week. This is a bullish week, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm declaring it such, David. It is a bullish and we week. got some green candles when we get to the markets. But before we get in, David, we got a message from our friends and sponsors over at Layer Zero. What do they want the folks at home to know? They want you to know that after a year, over a year of combined effort, Layer Zero and Google Cloud have announced their partnership and they are ready to build the interoperable cross-chain apps of the future. What is Layer Zero? Of course, Layer Zero is a set of smart contracts that are deployed on every single chain. These smart contracts connect to each other. How do they connect to each other? Well, they need some Oracle service in the center to uh, be the chatterboxes, the passing messages between all of the, the Layer Zero smart contracts across all of the 50 different chains. Google Cloud is that new default Oracle. That is the partnership that they have created. So there is a link in the show notes for you to go explore more. If you're a builder who wants to build on Layer Zero, uh, layerzero.network is also the URL. Well, you know what I want to learn more about this week, David, is uh, markets. Yeah. Okay. T tell, yeah. tell me about the old markets. I think, I think, I haven't looked at this yet, but I think we got some green on the week. We got some green, dude. Let's look at the Bitcoin charts first. What's Bitcoin showing us? Some single digit green. Look at that green right on the <laughs> we'll right on it. the right. Yeah, that, that, that's your your dose of dopamine Ooh. for this week. It's like, whoo, Bitcoin look up two percent, whopping two yes. percent. Start of the week at twenty six thousand six hundred, ending uh, ending the week at well Thursday morning, if you call that the end of the week. It's not the end of the week. Twenty seven thousand one hundred fifty, up two percent. Uh, Ether price up a little bit more, starting the week at sixteen sixty, up four and a half percent to the current price, uh, excuse me, starting the week at 1560, ending the week at uh, right around 1660, where we are right now. 1660. I yeah. mean, it's still low. That is a low price. It's, we are yeah. getting excited about very little right now. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> up such a small degree, you shouldn't even be excited Ooh, about this. Four and, and a half yet percent. we are. <laughs> yet we are. Four, four and a half percent on the week. I'll tell you, it. it's better than four. When, when's the last time we had a double digit week, man? <sighs> double digit up or down? Up, I can't remember up. either. Actually, it's, we've been we've been in the flatlands yeah. for so long. It's yeah. just like kind of a little bit of a bleed yep. out yeah, all the way back. from 1900. Weren't yep. we over 2000 a few weeks ago? Yeah, we'll we have touched we again. have touched over 2000 in this bear market. But man, zooming it's out on the cracking charts. Feel like it. Yeah. Last time we were at 2K was uh, July. In July, yeah. briefly. We went I can't even remember July. Um, oh, then, I was I was in the mountains. It's been downhill ever since I've been in, I caught back for the mountains. Yeah, it really was. It's been all downhill since you guys. So you got the the only thing you could do, David, is go go to the mountains. Bad things happen to Gary Gensler when you go to the mountains. Although, I guess nothing bad happened to him this week. Anyway, I, I'm skipping too far ahead. Yeah. We'll, we'll have our Gary later in the episode. Uh -huh. ETH Bitcoin uh, up two percent. Total crypto market cap one point one one trillion dollars. Uh, layer two scaling factor touched six percent uh, this week, down to five point five percent. Still at all time highs. Layer zero, or excuse Wait, me. Wait, what, what touched 6%? Excuse this me, not Total 6%. value lock? 6X. 6X six six is what I meant. Uh, six activity. X. Yes, That's what la layer two at. activity uh, touched 6X of Ethereum's. 
Uh, and so, uh, but now it's at 5.69. Nice. 60 transactions per second, 64 transactions per second. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that's where we get the six X. So, you know, we got, we got more transactions per second left in this tank, I think. Oh yeah. Uh, David, you want, you want to talk about the general markets, like all the trad fi market markets. You want to talk about macro really quick? Cause it's been super confusing to me. And then I read this we're, tweet. All, we're also doing a macro show on Tuesday as well. So a oh. ma macro show, uh, so talking about the state of macro from a crypto person. So it's a crypto person who understands macro. So I'm really excited for that show. Okay. Are you a crypto person that understands macro, David? Do you understand well, macro? When I have a smarter macro person with me, then yes, I understand macro. My question to you is, does anybody really understand macro? Mm. particularly right now and oh, this gets current, to the heart. current snapshot definitely yeah. not all right so here's the tweet current situation one stocks are falling like a recession is coming mm. yeah two oil prices are rising like there's no recession in, in sight hmm. Hmm. that's contradictory okay. three right. interest rates are rising like we have 10 percent inflation yeah. yes they are four gold is falling like inflation is gone hmm. five housing prices are rising like rates are falling and six commercial real estate is falling like it's 2008 Nothing adds up here. Mm. That's the way I feel about macro right now. It's mm. very confusing. There is a confusing set of signals going on, and it's not adding up in my head. What do you think about this? Yeah, they, they follow through and they say it's the beginning. It's beginning to feel like a pivot point in sentiment. I don't know if um, I'm about to say what I think they are meaning by this, but when there's a bunch of confusion, people, I think brace for something, brace for clarity, and then whatever that clarity is will define sentiment. Like, where are we going? We don't know. As soon as we find out, we'll know how we feel about it, but we know it's going to be different from here. Different good or different bad? Those different, are the only two directions. Yeah, right. Yeah, I guess that's the yeah reductive take, take about it. Well, so, but it, it's basically like, we don't really know. We don't know. I mean, that, that's why I'm very interested in doing this episode, this macro episode next week to see what, mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the, the newest macro person kind of knows. I, I will say one thing, though. I, I think volatility is back on the menu. I think that's what this means. Mm -hmm. Because when the market doesn't know what direction it's going to go in, then it can kind of like lurch mm -hmm. in one direction or the other. Uh, so weird macro climate right now <laughs> on the back of stimulus, on the back of yeah. money printing. Like what, mm -hmm. what's going on here? And just to be clear about something, we've previously talked about stocks being at all-time highs. That's been like kind of the theme of the last mm, two months, or I would say, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, so from looking at the SPY, you don't have the chart up, but it has declined by seven percent since um, July. So the yeah. SP the SPY is down seven percent, which is yeah, that, more, that, more. Yeah, stocks are that goes to the first bullet down. point. Yes. Stocks are falling like a recession right. is coming. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's down seven percent just doesn't feel like a lot to me. To, in to the, well, in the trad market, seven percent is a lot historically, but not recently. Seven percent in the trad market is actually that's just like trad markets are also volatile. <sighs> okay. Well, we'll try to make sense of this, but uh, let's get let's get back to crypto. This is a, mm. a negative report from J.P. Morgan, who said Ethereum's activity post Shanghai. That was the last hard fork back in March. Yeah. Uh, has been disappointing. J.P. Morgan calling Ethereum's progress disappointing. They've got some reasons for this. Well, While the shift from proof of work to proof of stake meant that the energy consumption from Ethereum collapsed by 99%, the Ethereum supply is shrinking and staking rose sharply by 50% since the Shanghai upgrade. While that happened, the increase in network activity has been rather disappointing. Mm -hmm. Ethereum's daily transactions, daily active addresses, and total value locked on DeFi protocols on the network have all experienced declines since the last hard fork. So JP Morgan, their analyst, expressing, uh, expressing some uh, bearishness here expressing uh, over the last six months or so. Yes. Yeah. I'm not my mad, just disappointed. Yeah. With my, my response to that is, who the hell are you? <laughs> JP Morgan doesn't know how to analyze these things. Well, disappointing with know. Ethereum post Shanghai activity, bruh. It's just the broader crypto downturn, and also he—they're just wrong. He, JP Morgan, he is wrong. Uh, they say layer twos have displayed mixed results. Well, no, TVL and ac economic activity on a layer twos across the board are all up. I don't know where the hell they're getting their data from, but not only is their data wrong, but their analysis is poor. Okay, well, let's go to the actual numbers, Stephen. La mm -hmm. Layer 2 beat provides a good source for value locked on Layer 2s. What are we looking at? Uh, at the 180-day time frame, it's basically flat. Mm. It's, it's marginally up. It's basically mm -hmm. flat. So flat, and flat TVL, $10.5 .10 billion. Uh, activity is up. It's up so much. It's unequivocally up by a lot. I'm disappointed in J.P. Morgan. 
<laughs> wow. Uh, have you ever been um, not disappointed with J.P. Morgan, David? I'm generally I, disappointed by banking in general. <laughs> really? Yeah. You should start a podcast I called should. Bankless, David, <laughs> about escaping your bank <laughs> over time, slowly. Um, I think Vance Spencer put that tweet in perspective as well. Actually, I don't think he was responding to that tweet in particular. But, but we are. Um, we got some perspective here yeah. from Vance Spencer. This is Ethereum, if you chart it against some of the fastest growing tech companies in human history, companies like Alphabet, it was Google, of course, and, and Meta, or Zoom, or Microsoft, and how quickly over time it took them to surpass 10 billion in revenue, okay? How mm. long did it take them? It took Ethereum seven years, and so when charted against revenue. these other tech companies, there's only one that did that faster, mm. and that is, is Google. Google, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Ethereum really did all of its $10 billion of revenue inside of like, 2020 to 2023. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so uh, look at this line. It's just kind of like a, you know, a slope yeah. line up. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, doing pretty well, all things considered, JP Morgan. Not so. disappointing. <laughs> I'm not disappointed by this. And I'm not disappointed. Um, also, long term perspective, not disappointed in the price of ETH over the last seven years either. Yep. Um, I, not, not. And we can keep going. Uniswap this week hit one or 300 million in swaps. 300 million unique uh, trades, swaps, has happened on Uniswap. Uniswap was invented in 2019. 300 million swaps since 2019. That's, is that disappointing? Swaps. Is that disappointing? Um, I'm not disappointed um, by that in the slightest. No, I feel great about that. 300, I retain 000, my disappointment million. about JP Morgan. You know, I think it's part of um, a broader crypto sentiment. And I've seen a lot of takes just in general in, in news, but even in uh, financial analyst news like JP Morgan Research, that sort of thing. It comes back, back down to this, David. Mainstream thinks that crypto is dead. Right. Again, like always, this always happens. Uh, and this is what makes this a buying opportunity, Lucrative. as with previous right. cycles. Um, and when crypto 10Xs the next cycle, don't let anybody tell you you didn't earn it. Right. Because if you're buying here, when everyone is saying crypto is dead, it's never coming back, that they're Ethereum disappointed. Is disappointed. <laughs> That's how you earn. The it's so easy. Here. The the signals are just being laid at our feet right now. They really are. Uh, somebody, I, I tweeted something like that out, and somebody responded with this um, life cycle. Uh, what are we looking at here? Yeah, yeah, just like the the cycle of the bull bear market. So in the top of the bull market, some crypto friend of you will will tell you. A bankless listener, you're so lucky. Uh, I wish that I bought too. And then the crypto market will go down and be like, you're an idiot. I told you crypto was a scam. Uh, yeah. So like, especially when they say the words like disappointing, it's like such an emotional word. It's like kind of just playing into the readership. I don't know if JP Morgan is about that game. Um, but yeah, well, I mean, like that's where we're in the stage of the cycle where everyone thinks you're an idiot. And they, they told you it was a scam and you can't talk about crypto at your family events or parties because you're just the crypto moron who knows nothing. Right. And ha ha ha, SBF, FTX, uh, yeah, that's yeah, so yeah. stupid. Uh, you know, sc scams, frauds, NFTs are such a joke. Well, so you're granted, right some now. of those things are actually true. Like, sure, <laughs> sure. Um, but if you're still in crypto and you know why you're here. Right. And you're, you have, you're no longer buying the scams because you can identify them. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. then and then you'll swing back to like, I am a genius. I am amazing. Yep. I am yep. lucky. Uh, you know, or, or the third parties will say you're lucky when, when that happens and you'll right. feel like genius. Yeah, anyway, yeah. Been, you've happens. been chewing glass for three years. But, you know, you got lucky, though. <laughs> you got lucky. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how about the Bitcoin ETF, David? Here's a tweet from James Seyfert. Um, what's this about? Uh, he just says that the SEC has come out super early and delayed the ARK Invest and 21 shares Bitcoin ETF filing. There, there wasn't a decision due until November 11th, and typically up until recently, the SEC has always gone up right up until the buzzer. Um, but they decided to uh, delay their decision on this earlier than usual. Um, the you know why, partially? It's some of the speculation. Yeah. It's because the government's about to shut down. The U.S. Yeah. government's about to shut down. Yeah, so that's on Monday, right? On Monday? Yeah, so apparently if by Sunday night, this Sunday night, uh, Congress doesn't reach some sort of <laughs> compromise, re resolution, whatever, agreement to keep the government running, then it shuts down yet again. I yeah. mean, how many times have we been through this? Yeah, And so this, this is the SEC just getting ahead of that <laughs> so that um, the stuff doesn't expire while the gov government shut down. 
And I guess, I, I don't know what would happen if the government shut down and, and, you know, these deadlines were missed, but maybe they would de facto be approved. <laughs> I think that could be how it works. So they're trying Is this to some sort of, of pseudo oracle, Mar- uh, oracle about how the uh, SEC thinks that if we do go for a shutdown, we'll get shut down all the way until at least November 11th? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea what this could mean. Um, I do know this is uh, good news. So Congress, de- both Democrats and Republican lawmakers sent a letter to Gary Gensler pleading that he approve a spot Bitcoin ETF, okay? And I, I wouldn't from, even, I'm not even sure I would use the word uh, pleading. The, the first line in this article, in this uh, letter says, we write to ensure the SEC does not continue to discriminate yeah, against you're right. spot I Bitcoin. Have said that pleading. is not a We're plea. not begging that, him. That is a We harsh. hired him. Yeah. That's the thing. He's not our king, right? I always yeah, forget this. Uh-huh. Like, we, he actually works for us and the people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, he's part of the executive branch, but he works for the, the people. The, that, the, that's us. And Congress mm-hmm. can rein him in. Right. He operates under their legislation. And they, they, they said in this letter, following the Court of Appeals decision, there's no reason to continue to deny such applications under inconsistent and discriminatory standards. So that's Congress's take. And we're going to see a bit of the grilling that Gary takes in front of Congress in yeah. the next section. But one other thing this could mean, actually, David, is Ether Futures ETFs could be trading as early as Tuesday. Hmm. This is all part of this government shutdown. Oh, um, we need to keep the government open until yeah. Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the SEC is looking to speed things up in order to get it done before the looming shutdown. Oh. Okay, so they might actually approve it wow. before. If they were going to approve it anyway, They're throwing then us they'll just approve it before the government shuts down. So that could happen. So okay. there could be a world where we actually have ETH futures trading on Tuesday. And we'll be talking about that next week if we do. Uh, fun fact, the crypto volume, crypto volumes are like heavily favored towards futures as soon as futures have ever come about. So the Ether futures, uh, it, that's a big unlock. It's a big yeah. unlock. Well, you think it's a good thing or a bad thing? There's always that debate of whether when you have kind of big liquidity unlocks, whether people just hit sell or people hit buy or what that, you know, what happens in the short run. Right. Way. Okay. So why, why do people think that? Well, we got, we, got, we got Bitcoin futures ETF at the top of the market in 2017. And then we just proceeded to dump for 12 months. Yeah. That was just a t- coincidence of the timing. Like, no, yeah. it's like, just, I think it's just going to either do nothing or just amplify the trend that's already happening. Is what's more, going to happen. more liquidity is bullish. And yeah. it's, it's even more bullish when prices are low and liquidity is low. Like when you okay. add liquidity to a low liquid market, prices go up fundamentally. Yeah. All right. What's, what's coming up next, David? Coming up next, Gary gets grilled in front of Congress again. We've clipped out some of the best moments so we can just all have our shot in Freud. Uh, meanwhile, <laughs> crypto bites back. At the same time, Coinbase leads with uh, their hashtag stand with crypto day at Capitol Hill. So we got some pictures and coverage around that. Kevin Owaki gave some great takes. A lot of, a lot of uh, you know, friends and family were all out there. Uh, penguins are in Walmart. Pudgy Penguins lands a big deal with Walmart. Uh, we'll talk about the, the nuances and details behind that as well. All of this coming up more. But first, a moment to talk about some of these fantastic sponsors that make this show possible, especially Kraken, a preferred crypto exchange in 2023. If you do not have an account with Kraken, consider clicking the link in the show notes to get one today. Kraken Pro has easily become the best crypto trading platform in the industry. The place I use to check the charts and the crypto prices, even when I'm not looking to place a trade. On Kraken Pro, you'll have access to advanced charting tools, real-time market data, and lightning-fast trade execution, all inside their spiffy new modular interface. Kraken's new customizable modular layout lets you tailor your trading experience to suit your needs. Pick and choose your favorite modules and place them anywhere you want in your screen. With Kraken Pro, you have that power. Whether you are a seasoned pro or just starting out, join thousands thousands of traders who trust Kraken Pro for their crypto trading needs. Visit pro.kraken.com to get started today. Cello is the mobile-first, EVM-compatible, carbon-negative blockchain built for the real world. And now, something big is happening. Introducing the Cello Layer 2. It's a game-changing proposal that's going to bring Cello's rapidly growing ecosystem home to Ethereum. Vitalik has shared his excitement for the Cello Layer 2 on the Cello Forum. So has Ben Jones from Optimism. But why? The Cello Layer 2 will bring huge advantages, like a decentralized sequencer, off-chain data availability, and one-block finality. What does all that mean? Rock-solid security, a trustless bridge to Ethereum, and more real world use cases for Ethereum without compromise. And real world adoption is happening. Active addresses on Celo have grown over 500% in the last six months. With the Celo Layer 2, gas fees will stay low and you can even pay for gas using ERC20 tokens. But Celo is a community governed protocol. This means that Celo needs you to weigh in and make your voice heard. Join the conversation in the Celo forum. Follow at Celo.org on Twitter and visit Celo.org to shape the future of Ethereum. 
Gary Gensler under pressure this week in front of Congress. He was grilled, I would say. We got some clips coming up, but he testified before the House Financial Services Committee. And uh, Republicans, I would say, are increasingly apoplectic about the more than 40 rules Gensler has been proposing lately, um, especially now that the, the market is adopting them. And he's been blamed for kneecapping U.S. capital markets. And some of the discussion was actually about crypto as well. And some guests made some appearances, particularly some pro-crypto legislators asking some questions of Mr. Gensler. David, you actually uh, did this for us. You live streamed this whole entire event and you helped uh, curate the mm -hmm. clips that we're about to watch. What were your takes as you were like watching this uh, this event unfold? Like it's, is it just like watching C-SPAN? Is it boring? Yeah, so there. So everyone in the Senate Finance, uh, the House Finance Committee, gets to have their like five minutes um, where they talk, just talk and they ask Gary questions. Um, and so there's a wide variety of subjects. There was actually before we get into the crypto stuff, there was a lot of focus on climate change and capital markets around climate change, and huh. it just seems so contrived. I was like really frustrated because like all the people that were bringing up like climate change, like they couldn't connect it to the SEC in any way. I'm like, why this? Is? And so they just um, wanted to talk about climate change, kind of, and yeah, so they a, kind a little of bit. It was a little bit forced. Fit that in. At, at okay. least it was. It felt forced to me. Um, so it starts off with uh, uh, Pat McHenry. Henry, who always starts these things off. I and mean, this is the second time we've done this. So I've seen this kind of rodeo for the second time now. So Patrick McHenry starts it off, grills Gary Gensler because he's a pro crypto person. So it always starts off with a bang. And then <sighs> the, the, uh, the baton is immediately passed to Maxine Waters, who dumb last scene who blowing doused, kisses right, to well, SBF. Yeah, so <laughs> so she's just like dousing water, like her last name, on the on the whole thing because she because Patrick McHenry starts off saying I'm fed up and tired with with uh, Gary Gensler shenanigans, and then Maxine Waters goes, well, I'm fed up and tired with the opposite side of the aisle, and this oh, immediately okay. turns it into red versus blue. <laughs> And oh, so there okay. was a lot of like red versus bluing about it. Uh, um, and so fun. that was the start. And then it went into like 30 minutes of non crypto stuff. Okay. All, all the good stuff happened at the end. So you had to wait well, to the very end where. Well, let's uh, play the good stuff. Warren, you, you pulled Torres, out the... and Wagner. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. What are we about to watch? So I think the first clip is um, Patrick we're gonna, McHenry. We're going to start with Patrick McHenry because he starts the whole thing off all right, let's play. In, a, in a fantastic bow tie. You've got serious questions to answer to the public and to Congress. And we intend to get your compliance. We can do it the easy way or the hard way. Ooh, Woo! That, Clint Eastwood. I yield back. The ranking member is now recognized for five minutes. Wow, okay, that really sets okay. the tone. Yes, the ranking member is Maxine Waters. We're not going to play that because it's just dumb. Uh, we're only going to play the good stuff. <laughs> Who's this? Uh, this is Mrs. Wagner. Uh, she is a uh, big fan. I'm confused at which Gary Gensler, the American public, should believe. The academic version, who spoke glowingly about the power of technology to help more investors MIT, participate Gary. in U.S. Like and yeah. capital, global capital markets, or the SEC version, who apparently thinks like all use of any technology by broker dealers and investment advisors is inherently conflicted, and firms should just stop using technology altogether. <laughs> Mr. Gensler, you know, could you please briefly explain this change in your views? I thank you for the question, a clever question. It's the same Gary clever. Gensler. It's not my identical twin brother, Rob, or anything. It's me. Wait, yeah, wait. Yeah, so, so this is how I found out that Gary Gensler has an identical twin brother. I don't, we don't have that clip in the agenda, but I feel like now we have to actually uh, bring that up. No, no, no. Okay, we need to talk about this. So Gary Gensler actually has an identical twin brother. We don't, we don't have that in the agenda, but we'll, we'll put a, um, we'll go and pause and go get the clip, and then we'll do this after yes, we... Yes, uh, we uh, need to hear more about we, we Gary Gensler. First the lashing, and then we'll find out, we'll talk about the Gary Gensler identical twin brother. Who okay, th this exist. was the best one, though. This yes. is my favorite clip, maybe the clip mm -hmm. of the year that I've seen from um, Representative Richie Torres, who's actually been on the Bankless podcast before. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. So let's play it. Suppose I were to purchase a Pokemon card. Would doing so constitute a security transaction? <laughs> uh, you can purchase a Pokemon card. It's, I, I don't know what the context is, but if you're okay. just purchasing a Pokemon card. If I purchase a Pokemon a, card, is that a, a security store, transaction? Store, that's not a security. Okay. If I were to purchase a tokenized Pokemon card on a so digital true. exchange via a blockchain, is that a security transaction? I, I'd have to know more. Okay, so so for you, the process of tokenization is what transforms a non-security transaction you, into you, a security you, transaction? Look, 
it, if, if the investing I thought you were technology neutral. If, oh, wow. <laughs> he asked the question, David, that we've always wanted to ask. How okay, about so, baseball cards? How about Pokemon cards mm -hmm. and these securities? So the, the, Miss Wagner is like, yo, uh, MIT version of Gary was pro-blockchain, but uh, SEC Gary is anti-blockchain. And then Richie Torres is like, yo, is a Pokemon card a security? <laughs> these people are <laughs> listening to crypto it. Twitter. They are oh, like, th these are no, our things. They, we, that, the power of crypto Twitter is like getting into Congress. Well, it's because <laughs> it's distilled logic. I mean, <laughs> Gary Gensler <laughs> thinks that everything that is tokenized should be a security. And that is mm -hmm. just an untenable position. Right. That's an yep. untenable position. He, right. he refuses to provide any clarity. We are not saying, on the crypto side, we are not saying that um, tokenized things can't be securities. There are things that are tokenized that can be securities. We're not taking the binary, every token is not a security. Mm -hmm. He is taking the binary, every token is a security. And right. he's got to defend that. And it's indefensible. Right. Or else Pokemon cards and Magic the Gathering cards and Pogs mm -hmm. and all of these NFT, all of these things are mm -hmm. securities. Uh, and it's so satisfying. Yeah. yeah. To, I, look, I know this is just um, just like kind of showboating. It's, a, it's, a, it's for the show. This is a it's carnival. for the show. On. I know yeah. that. But it's, it's still, important. It's important it, because each representative is trying to give scaffolding for their constituents to rally behind. Yes. And so even though like nothing is getting done. We are just publicly, la like, Gary is just having tomatoes thrown at him, and he's going to go home and shower it off. He's going to be totally fine. Yeah, but, like, it, the public is, is like, these are scaffolding for the public to go around. It's also, Spe I think this meme will spread, David. This clip is, I've yes. already seen it all over the right. place. It's spreading kind of like the, you and know, And that's Gary the best thing Pokemon. that we, we could expect. That's the yep. best outcome that we could, is, like, we have memeable clips that are showing what a far scary Gensler is. Governing this country by meme, I guess that's yes. what we're descending into here. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Look at okay, this. so did you see this? So uh, in every uh, every one of these, this is the second time or third time that we've had one of these, Gary Gary gets a few minutes to speak. Like, he gets to, to say words. Um, opening statements. So, so opening statements. Someone in the back of the camera behind Gary pulled out the Coinbase Stand With Crypto Shield uh, wow, logo icon and right. was just, like, flashing it, like, holding it there. There's, uh, in a different clip, you also see a Stand With Crypto bag. So, like, Gary, while he's saying his statements about, like, how crypto's full of frauds, there's a bunch of, like, Stand With Crypto icons, like, in the back. Great. Great stuff. Yeah. Ironically, by the way, that's an NFT, which Gary Gensler probably thinks that is, is an NFT. You're totally right. I forgot <laughs> about that. <laughs> and if you, you contrast it to, remember, uh -huh. 2017, Janet Yellen, yeah, yeah. buy uh -huh. Bitcoin? Yeah. It's not the first time this has happened. Yeah, yeah. Um, I interviewed that guy, by the way, on POV Crypto. Oh, the buy Bitcoin guy? Yeah, the buy Bitcoin guy. Why did yeah. he do that? What's the story uh, he, there? He's an, he's an Urbit guy. He's an Urbit guy? He's an okay. Urbit, yeah. Uh -huh. Pretty passionate then. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, okay, so that was the Gary Grilling in front of DC. Uh -huh. And you know, hopefully we get some clips, we get some memes, we get some arguments. We don't expect a lot to come from uh, the lashing otherwise. Okay, we get we got to come back to the twin thing. So Gary yeah. Gensler has an identical twin. That's yeah, it. And you... You have a there, video that proves this? Yes, yeah, so there, there's a video. Uh, do, uh, this is Gary Gensler in MIT world talking about crypto. Uh, and he brings in his brother, identical twin brother, Rob, who I think at the time is working at T. Rowe Price. Okay, so like the person you see on your screen is Gary Gensler. Now watch closely because you might lose him because there's two of them. This is Rob. That's Gary. Uh, That's <laughs> Rob Gensler. Oh, wow, Rob. Rob. What the shit? What do you think Rob thinks about crypto, David? Do you think he's like a, crypt a big crypto fan? That'd be hard to go in public Bro, as a crypto fan. Bro, this is like, like Mr. Smith from The Matrix. There's like two <laughs> of them. <laughs> it's funny. What? Yeah, didn't know about that. So a that big reveal this week. nuts. Uh, twin identical brother that is hope, maybe pro crypto i want to meme that into existence <laughs> I, we should get rob on the podcast <laughs> there's a horcrux joke here somewhere well to fight these uh forces of genslerness in dc <laughs> crypto showed up crypto showed up on capitol hill this week so what are we looking at coinbase has organized this uh, stand with crypto day where just a bunch of crypto founders and leaders and policy advocates came to capitol hill to advocate for crypto conveniently at the same time that Gensler was in his hearing. Coincidence? I think not. So 50 plus founders from over 15 different states all visited DC. Uh, and so this has been a, uh, this was not just like people visiting, this was a, a big push. This was a policy and advocacy push. Here is Brian Armstrong on Yahoo Finance uh, getting interviewed. I thought it was a great little clip. 
Yeah, so Stand With Crypto is here to tell people that 52 million Americans have now used crypto. That's 3x the number that own electric vehicles. It's more than hold union cards in the United States. It's a massive constituency, and they're frankly a little unhappy with the U.S. because the U.S. is lagging behind. We don't have clear rules on the books, like 83% of the rest of the G20 countries, to, for how crypto should be regulated, how consumers should be protected, and how this innovation can happen here in the U.S. And so, there's a couple of bills going through the House right now that have bipartisan support for how we get clear market structure, how we get stable coins in the U.S. And these entrepreneurs and the 52 million Americans really want this to happen. And so we're here, we're here talking about um, Stand With Crypto. We've got the pins. People can check out standwithcrypto.org and sign up if they want to be a crypto advocate. This is a, something America needs to get right. The well, pins, the of course, points. are, are the, the shields, the, the shield pins, yeah. And yeah, he's got these talking points absolutely rehearsed, comparing them to other constituents that people totally can, like, resonate with and vibe with on an emotional yeah. level, which is the right way to do this. Yeah, let's yeah, keep on going. It's, it's, it's actually pretty cool. Um, Brian also said this. I guess maybe he gave a speech on a, a, mm -hmm. a panel, at least, a statement on a panel, and he talks about Hayden Adams, the entrepreneurs, as, as he was referencing in that clip. Hayden Adams of Uniswap is an American hero. And I mean that literally he's the kind of person that any country in the world would kill to have building the future of technology. And Elizabeth Warren called him a shadowy super coder. He actually put that on his Twitter profile as a badge of honor. If that's what it means to be an innovator in this country, then I'm a shadowy super coder too. And it's despicable that anyone keeps attacking American heroes like this who are helping propel our economy and our freedom and the future of this country forward. That was a statement. Wow. Great, Brian Armstrong. Great Pretty line. Cool. Great line. Of course, uh, Hayden Adams on Twitter says, you know, thanks, Brian Armstrong. Thanks for the kind words. So glad we have you and Coinbase standing with DeFi and fighting for the whole industry. Really, I think that is what this represented as a symbol. We have 50 plus founders showing up the day Gary Gensler is getting a, a hearing to go meet like in a coordinated fashion with talking points and just like PR and press. Uh, and they had this like armored car out there, this painted blue armored car that was all about, hey, money doesn't need to be driven around in armored cars in the year 2023. Let's upgrade the financial system. So, saying that 87% of Americans would think that we should upgrade our financial system. And 52 million Americans own crypto. So there's obviously a wide base of support. That is the, the facts that Coinbase is coming to Capitol Hill with. And overall, it just was a the biggest show of force, a coordinated show of force of support for crypto on Capitol Hill on on a day where you know it counted more than most. Yeah, that's r real people, right? And one of the shadowy super coders that showed up is our, our friend Kevin Owaki. Uh, uh -huh. He showed up the in this shadowiest. cohort. And this was actually a fantastic um, thread of his just takeaways. Mm -hmm. And I think we should read a few of them. Um, so this was his experience. He's one of 40 founders invited to DC in the Stand With Crypto Day. Uh, and then he reiterates the stats that that you just gave. Mm -hmm. The first day of their session was watching Gary Gensler uh, live. So they actually got to go into the con congressional chambers and watch this live. And Kevin makes a comment. It kind of explains why there was a stand with crypto. Yeah, somebody <laughs> was in there. Somebody was there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, who was it? Um, and he said, well, I found the hearing to itself to be pretty toothless uh, and that most Congress people wanted mostly to get sound bites. That's what yep. we saw a little yep. bit. It's still nice to see that Gensler's prejudices against crypto are not shared by all of the legislative branch. And next, they met with some of the uh, congressional leaders. So Richie Torres, Mark Molinero, uh, Hakeem Jeffries, uh, several more. And uh, Kevin goes on. Some lines that we'll pull out here. Uh, he's, Kevin Iwaki says, the White House doesn't like crypto, but no one really seems to know why. As far as I know, <laughs> no one with Stand With Crypto was able to meet with the executive branch. Interesting. So they're still um, not engaging in the executive still branch. Still not engaging, yeah. Uh, he says, quote of the day was from Mike Novogratz, who was also there. The extra legal debanking of crypto companies is the most un-American thing I've ever seen. Hard agree. Quote, quote of the day, yeah. Uh, he says, uh, this stank of SBF seems to have mostly lifted. The, op <laughs> the opportunists <laughs> who use SBF and FTX implosion to advance their agenda last year have already played their hands already. Wow, nice. And then la last thing I'll pull out here is, uh, Kevin says, it was cool to sit shoulder to shoulder pushing for regulatory clarity with prominent, prominent crypto luminaries like Brian Armstrong, Ryan Selkis, Mike Novogratz, or Fred Arisom. Uh, and then, of course, he finishes with the action item of call your congressman. This is not just him saying, hey, you should do this. This is saying, hey, this is what is the most effective. This is the advice that I've gotten from people in Congress who I just talked to. Call your congressman. If you don't know who or how to approach them, you can check out Coinbase's guide 
at www.standwithcrypto.org. So that is your big action item bank list listener Literally, for the, for the week. Yeah, go to, go to standwithcrypto.org and just press the buttons and then call your congressman. Sorry, you might have to be a U.S. citizen for this one. So sorry to all our international users, but we're, we're fighting America, you know, in America. Uh, for this, for sure. Um, David, speak of America, what's more American than Walmart? Uh, and we got pudgy penguins on the shelves. What happened this week? Yeah, 2,000 Walmart stores have put pudgy penguin like uh, stuffed animals on their shelves. Uh, so this is just a big co-marketing push between pudgy penguins and Walmart. Walmart even tweeted out the pudgy penguins, like retweeted and, and showed their, their, added their own quote to the pudgy penguins like animation about pudgy penguins being in Walmart. Uh, I mean, this is probably the biggest distribution event for any uh, NFT ever. Can you describe uh, what you're actually talking about? So you're not just talking about the NFTs, of course. If, in no, case no, it, no. In no, case not, it wasn't the NFTs, obvious, yeah. you're talking like, about stuffed, stuffed animals. animals. Yeah, pudgy penguin stuffed are. animals. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh-huh. my God, they're so cute. Do you have a pudgy penguin, David, still? No, I sold mine. I you sold yours? I bought him the shit out of that. I, I took a long bet on cool cats and sold pudgies, and I that was the wrong trade. <laughs> No, no cool cats at Walmart. Well, yeah. Pudgies was an interesting project because it got like resold to somebody else, right? Yeah, it right. Yeah. So the-, it, the founders sold it to this guy, Luca, who I think has just been doing absolutely. Is that the guy in the work. video? Is that this uh, guy? That I don't, I don't know if that's him. Um, uh, but yeah, he's been doing just a killer job executing. He's coming from the old world of IP and just IP growth. So uh, Pudgy Penguin toys cost between $3 and $12, depending on the toy. The, okay, the crazy thing about this is each toy has, um, an, I think, one of those RFID chips in there. And so each toy has its own identity as an NFT on ZK Sync era where people can build their fud- forever pudgy characters inside of the pudgy world, their digital social platform. So, you know, mini games interact with others. Uh, and then you get like some certain like traits. There, there's like this on-chain component where every single it stuffed is. animal has a life on ZK Sync era. Big win for ZK Sync era. Really cool. It's really cool altogether. Yeah. I mean, we have a, you know, an NFT that's r- redeemable for some sort of token representation on a yeah. layer two. A yeah. ZK EVM layer This is layer like an IRL verse metaverse kind of connection. Yeah, I love it. NFTs really, in Walmart is somehow a fitting in the spear market too. Yeah. <laughs> we are we are down bad, but actually, I'm I'm incredibly bullish. I mean, this is the big potential for NFTs is really as a kind of a brand. Uh, you know, in some ways, a headless mm-hmm. brand. In some ways, like a kind of a you know a centralized uh, led brand. So uh, are you going to get one of these stuffed animals? Are they cute enough? Or are you just interested in the speculation aspect, David? I'm not necessarily a collector of um, stuffed animals, but for other, I, I do think there is some like interesting dichotomy of like crypto degens owning pudgy penguins and then like children thinking that that's their favorite stuffed animal <laughs> because it is like, that's a funny thing of, of I don't know. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Uh, oh, look at this. Some of them are getting swept. So yeah. looks like it's not just for children. Looks like some of the NFT, um, like well, that's this is Luca. This is the CEO of Pudgy Penguins. Oh, okay. he's, buying, he's buying his <laughs> he own buy, products. He probably, he probably put product. that on the company card. That's a he's yield farming Pudgies right now. <laughs> <laughs> all right, what do we got coming up next? Coming up next, did you know there's like six forks of friend tech and it's all on different chains? We'll talk about all of them, but not really. We're just going to burn through those. Uh, Vitalik deepfakes and how we can stop them. And also Chase Bank has banning crypto payments in the UK. Uh, oof, not great. This is why we go bankless, of course. So we're going to get to all of that and more. But first, a moment to talk about some of these fantastic sponsors that make this show possible, especially MetaMask Portfolio. If you have not opened up your MetaMask Portfolio, it is a new and improved way of looking at all your crypto assets on all the various chains. There's a link in the show notes. Go find out. Let's go hear from them right now. Are you a MetaMask user? Well, you're listening to Bankless, so of course you are. The wallet you know and love just got a whole lot better. MetaMask Portfolio is the ultimate one-stop shop for all of your crypto needs. It gives you a holistic view of your crypto portfolio across multiple chains and multiple addresses all at once. You can easily view and manage all your coins, tokens, and NFTs in one convenient place just by connecting your wallet. MetaMask Portfolio goes beyond just viewing your portfolio, though. Inside the portfolio, you can do all the incredible money verbs that make D so powerful. You can buy, swap, bridge, and stake your crypto assets with ease. It's like having a powerful battle station for all your DeFi moves right at your fingertips. So if you're looking to do more in Web3 your way, MetaMask Portfolio is the answer. I already know that you have MetaMask Wallet, so go check out your MetaMask Portfolio. Learn more at metamask.io slash portfolio. You know Uniswap, it's the world's largest decentralized exchange with over $1.4 trillion in trading volume. You know this because we talk about it endlessly on Bankless. It's Uniswap, but Uniswap is becoming so much more. Uniswap Labs just released the Uniswap Mobile Wallet, 
for iOS, the newest, easiest way to trade tokens on the go. With a Uniswap wallet, you can easily create or import a new wallet, buy crypto on any available exchange with your debit card with extremely low fiat on-ramp fees, and you can seamlessly swap on Mainnet, Polygon, Arbitrum, and Optimism. On the Uniswap mobile wallet, you can store and display your beautiful NFTs, and you can also explore Web3 with the in-app search features, market leaderboards, and price charts, or use Wallet Connect to connect to any Web3 application. So you can now go directly to DeFi with the Uniswap mobile wallet. Safe, simple custody from the most trusted team in DeFi. Download the Uniswap wallet today on iOS. There's a link in the show notes. Ryan, this uh, clip of Vitalik has shown me which token I want to buy next. Let's play it. All right. Um, Everyone remembers when I sold billions of Shiba Inu tokens back in the day. Do I regret it? Well, I didn't. That is uh, not until I heard about SHIB Exchange. Um, you know, SHIB Exchange is pretty revolutionary in the crypto space. Making Shiba Inu the quote token is just genius. If I still had all those Shiba Inu tokens, I know exactly where I would take them. Let's fucking go. <laughs> Well, that that that, that is classic let's Vitalik. Let's fucking go. At That's the very classic end Vitalik. Of the, oh my right god! Is the, the the let's fucking go is just the funniest way to end this thing. Like when I was watching it, it's like yeah, yeah. I can I I know Vitalik's mannerisms. I don't. I know that that was like manipulated a little bit. But man, if you're not paying attention, or if you don't know Vitalik, then like yeah, this guy just yeah. What do you think? Exchange. What do you think that is out of ten? Like the the quality of this. This is one of the best quality defakes I've seen in a while because he's got the like relatively natural body movements, even though they're a little bit repetitive. Like the body movements are natural, and the voice was close. The voice is pretty good. It's not it's not quite there, but it's close ish. Vitalik will never ever say let's fucking go. I mean, with a different script, I think I would give it like a seven or eight out of 10, right? Yeah. Whereas like a 10 for me would be like indiscernible from right. somebody who spent yeah. some time virtually with Vitalik. It would right. be indiscernible from yeah. from that experience. And this is maybe a seven or eight, which like these are going to be these everywhere. Are pretty good. These are pretty good clips. Yeah. I mean, so many bots on Twitter all over the place of just like Vitalik, you know, is giving away mm-hmm. free ETH. It's right. it's always been this way since like yeah. 2016 onwards. Yeah, Vitalik's given free ETH. He, his image is going to be used in deep fakes in all sorts of ways. So uh-huh. what what is the prevention for this? How do we fix this problem? Well, of course, there's the Ethereum attestation service, but that's not a quick fix. That is going to be years of infrastructure and building in progress. We have the tools. Uh, we just need, you know, mat- maturation and development. The fix is that everyone just needs to know that the internet is not a safe place. And especially <laughs> with the emergence of private Thanks, keys David. and owning your own assets, like the internet is very unsecure at this very moment. Yeah, it's uh, a lot of so, phishing. Like a lot of a lot people want to steal your money. Uh, th- this was actually useful too on Twitter. Is the community notes? I've been mm-hmm. looking at this more and more on, on Twitter. So right. Readers added context they thought people would want to know. The video is a deep fake, <laughs> so that yeah, that's good context to know. So mm-hmm. be on your guard, and it, we'll, yeah. we'll get back to that. But hopefully, something like Ethereum attestation service will allow Vitalik to release Vitalik content signed right. with his private keys. Right. And that you know that is much uh, that that is unforgeable. As right. not fakeable. Whoever has his private keys can actually sign it. Yeah, the, the bull case for this is that actually every single bit of content will have some sort of attestation. And so weird content will be missing the attestation. And so it's it, the idea is like eventually everything will have some sort of tag of inception. Like where did this come from? And ta- like content without that tag will be extremely sus. Exactly. Yeah. Um, David, this is a pretty cool experiment with, yeah. uh, at, um, in Buenos Aires. Government ID coming to Ethereum, again, via ZK Sync. What's this? Yeah, so th- there's actually an interesting like corollary. Uh, I mean, maybe I'm just making this up in my head, but like pudgy penguins, you, when you buy the stuffed animal, you have this like NFT that has this digital identity on ZK Sync. Uh, the, this is, I mean, it's not anything to do with pudgy penguins or stuffed animals, but Buenos Aires, uh, the government of Buenos Aires, which is, um, of course, part of the gov- uh, uh, country of Argentina, but is also its own kind of like city state. Um, Buenos Aires citizens will be able to download this wallet and claim essential personal documents such as birth and marriage certificates, which are very important documents in Argentina for accessing the social benefits, using a digital wallet. So like self-custody of your digital documents uh, using your using a private key, using a wallet. Uh, and so this is being also being used on ZK Sync era. Uh, and so it's just a, a way for um, like infrastructure of the nation state, city state uh, sector of things, using public infrastructure to do things that they already need to do better. Yeah. Pretty cool. You could put anything in your wallet. 
Penguins are passports, right? <laughs> penguins are passports, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, this is cool. You know, Kraken, our number one recommended exchange for 2023, David, you know what they're up to? Tell me. They are getting ready to push into stock trading. This is a rumor. Uh, so I took this tweet uh, from Walter Bloomberg. Crypto exchange plans to push into stock trading. This came from the Bloomberg article that, that says this. Still Crypto a rumor? Exchange- uh, so, uh, uh, I asked Kraken, it's like, yo, what's going on with this? Uh, and their response is, Kraken is always exploring how it can power the global adoption of cryptocurrencies. We can't comment on rumors or speculation. We're looking huh. to broaden and enhance our offering okay. so clients continue to have secure and seamless ac- access to Kraken's full product suite. Pretty generic, neither confirm nor deny. Didn't I would say. say no. Didn't, they they didn't did not say no. say no. They did not say no. <laughs> and we have no special knowledge about this. No, uh, we don't. You know, all we know is basically that statement but um mm-hmm. this would be cool if true I, I would say as someone who has not bought an equity and, and a stock since 2018 up until this week actually uh we'll talk about that later in a different show um like robin hood ever said we always thought robin hood was like the the app for the people right like democratizing access to finance and then the whole yeah. like citadel gme thing just totally popped that bubble yep one of the big reasons why i haven't bought an equity is because uh, I don't want to use Robinhood. That's TradFi. I'd, I there are, is demand, believe it or not, for crypto people to buy. Equities. No, I believe it. Da- but David. we just, we just need a crypto native platform to do to go back the old to the old world. And Robinhood has good UX. Have you ever used something like ETrade or ever used something like Fide- Fidelity uh, or no, something like this? No. Uh, Charles Schwab. Excuse, no way. Like you couldn't. Like you would <laughs> you would not be able to navigate. I this. wouldn't know how to do it. It's so <laughs> stupid. It's so like two thousands era. Right. And yeah. and crypto exchanges have gotten the UX. Right, like yeah. it's easy to navigate, yes. and so why not start listing other assets? Take take Kraken Pro UX and put it into equities, and we can talk. Maybe there you go. <laughs> maybe maybe Kraken's resident. doing that. Maybe they're not. We have nothing. Maybe it's we a rumor. Know. Yeah, it could just be a rumor. Um, uh, a friend tech fork for every chain. Okay, there are all of these friend tech clones. We should have. We expected this would happen, right? Of course, yeah, a successful app is going to yeah. have like thousands of clones. What specifically is happening? How many clones do we have at this point? Okay, so on base, there's Friends Tech. There's Post Tech on Arbitrum. There's Frenzy on Solana. <laughs> there's Fan.Tech on Mantle. There's Alpha on Bitcoin. What the sh- oh Bitcoin, my god! What's Bitcoin L3? That's what this says. I don't know. It's people have been I, people have been trying to tweet at me saying, "Hey, David, you're really popular on Alpha on Bitcoin." You should sign up. And I'm like, I don't believe you. No one is in the Bitcoin world. They're trying popular. to steal your private keys, David. They're yeah. fishing you. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> of course, these are clones, so there's not a lot of difference. Um, but there is some like minor innovation. Uh, so one, um, there is one, one version of this clone is introducing a bidding action for new accounts in order to prevent bots. Um, another is including uh, features like public and private posts. So you could see accounts you could follow on Twitter, um, dark mode, stats mode, that, that sort of thing. Uh, referral system. So some are even working through the, uh, the economics of these platforms and like juicing them, making them maybe even more Ponzi-like in the games. So there's like these micro innovations that are happening across all of these clones. And I think that this will push things forward is the optimistic view is some of these features will work. Others won't. The ones that don't fall by the wayside and die. The ones that do will improve the product. Friend tech will continue to have to level up. Fortunes will be made. Fortunes will be lost. You know, that's what always happens in this space. But I, I do think a lot of exper- experiments will kind of level us up. I guess maybe the bear case for, for all of this is like, uh, it's too much fragmentation and we're just chasing a bunch of kind of, I don't know, nothing products. And this is, no- instead of innovating, everyone's copying, um, you know, the mm-hmm. other apps. I guess you could take a, um, a bear case on it too, but... Uh, yeah, overall, I think it's cool. And of course it would happen. This is crypto. It's completely yeah. permissionless. Well, as soon as you do get the forking phenomenon, it is just a big plus one to the legitimacy of the actual inception. Yeah. Right. Like Bitcoin had the fork and fair launch era. There was the ICO mania after Ethereum, DeFi food farms. Like anytime something gets forked a bajillion times, whatever it's is getting forked, it's, it's, it's very successful. In some, in some measure. Yeah. Some and I, I will say, even though I don't really understand the long-term economics, the long-term sustainability of Frontech, like it, it, 
doesn't care what I think. It is still alive. Yeah. Uh, and so I'll, I'll, I'll give a, pl a plus one to that. I am too exhausted to create accounts in all of these apps and try them all yeah. out. I've uh -huh. got my friend tech. That's it. Coming out of the OP stack super chain base world, base has introduced pessimism, which is an open source monitoring monitoring system designed to enhance security of base. Uh, Hilariously so, named as well, of yes, course, yes, not optimism. Right. Yes, it's, 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 it's the right way to, to view this. It's, it's a monitoring system for like, think of it as like a second line of defense. So post someone attempting to exploit you, whatever that means, smart contracts, the actual protocol, et cetera. This is an alert system after that fact. Uh, so there's like three different subsystems here. There's like a risk engine, alerting system, uh, and then just another system that's responsible for parsing and transforming real-time data. Basically trying to give you a, li a live alert of like, hey, some th shenanigans is going on. Uh, and there's a, it's just a monitoring system. So and all you, OP stack chains can benefit from this, right? So that's a really source. cool thing. Like yeah. the, this, this is kind of like it has previously been um, deployed in other contexts. We've the, we've seen other projects like this. But the cool thing about this is Base is building this to protect the Base chain for their Base users. It's just like extra protection for all Base users, and it's really important because that's Coinbase. But since it's on the OP stack, all OP stack chains can also leverage this open source system. So it, this is about everything growing in security all at once. We like it. We like it. Binance is interesting. Speaking of base, Binance is now supporting base as well. So you right. can uh, withdraw a deposit from Binance to base. Right. I, wonder, I wonder if that has any implications for the future of BNB chain, David. Right. That's the big question is like now with base, the BNB chain of the West, if you will. Uh, what is the future of BNB chain? That's always in. A, a do you, th do you think BNB chain just becomes a roll up at some point? I would. Like, I can only hope. Like you know, why be a side chain in in, in this yeah. in this economy? Why, why be a, side be a chain? silo when you could join in the crowd? Um, this is a Fred Wilson post. Uh, Fred Fred Wilson is a notable venture capitalist, Union Square Ventures. I followed his blog post for a while. I just noticed this week um, on September 9th, he's writing on the 27th. But on September 9th, apparently. He was the victim of a phishing attack. So he got over 40 of his NFTs stolen, some of his most valuable NFTs, 46 to be exact. And it was because, I believe he was in a, a crypto wallet. He doesn't mention the wallet, but I'm guessing it was probably like a Coinbase wallet. He received a, a message, maybe a message from XMTP, telling him to click this link. He says this, while waiting for our luggage, I got a push notification. I guess he was at the airport. So distracted, you know, waiting for your luggage. You just got a few minutes on your phone. Uh, in my wallet about an NFT drop that I could participate in. So I clicked the link, signed the transaction, and nothing happened. So I tried again. Again, nothing happened. Frustrated, I turned my attention to the luggage, retrieved it, and got in the car. On the way home, I tried again a few more times. Turns out that each of my failed attempts to mint an NFT was a scam that allowed a thief to eventually take 46 of my most valuable NFTs. David, we were just talking about this last week right. with Mark Cuban getting drained yeah. from a similar kind of phishing scam. It's unfortunate. Right. Um, yeah, do you, do you have a take on this? There is some good news at the end, but do you have a take on this first? I have two takes. One is that uh, you should not be having your wallet with 46 of your most valuable NFTs be your mobile wallet that you yes. have on your phone. That's so bad. if guys, That's so if you are, if you do that right now, right. stop doing that immediately. Right. Like don't don't sign do. things that are also ought to be your cold storage. Yes, um, have your cold storage a separate wallet completely right. from your yeah. active wallet that you do this kind of like activity on. My other take is that we should be able to sign messages with our cold storage and not get rugged. <laughs> <laughs> we should be we should do both. Uh, well, so how like, do we do the second there? Like <laughs> I don't, that yeah, that call for call for startups. Uh, yeah, we actually, delegate.cash uh, Fubar's project is working on this. Um, but yeah. still, there, there are a number of attempts. It's something we definitely have to solve because this is not good user experience to get drained of all of your yes. funds yeah. uh, because you clicked the wrong link. Um, right. Anyway, you know, and by the way, just the PSA is even the pros can even get pros. rugged like this. Even the pros. Um, actually, Anthony Sassano had a similar event that he talked yeah. about in the D Daily Gway earlier this week. If it can happen to someone like Fred or right. Anthony, it can happen to anybody. Um, David, what did Michael Saylor do last week? What does Michael Saylor do every week, Ryan? <laughs> he purchases Bitcoin. Also, all that Bitcoin Ether strength ratio, that was because Michael Saylor was buying a bunch of Bitcoin. Oh, really? Uh, purchase, yeah. This has happened like three times now. Like Bitcoin Ether shows strength, and then the it's Saylor. That, that it's Saylor. It was Sailor. <laughs> uh, purchased 5,445 Bitcoin for almost $150 million. Where does he get all this money? Wait, he just spent another $150 million on Bitcoin? Yes, yes, yes. 
That's he's, exactly right. He's borrowing it from bondholders. Yeah, but everyone <laughs> runs out of cap of margin. Like, the, if you run out of capital, sure, you take leverage, and then once sometimes you run out of margin. All right, anyways, he's at 075 percent of the 21 million. He uh, almost supply. owns one full percent three, of all three Bitcoin quarters, in existence. Over three quarters of one percent. Yeah, he is down eight percent uh, in dollar terms on his Bitcoin buy. <laughs> he is so like tenacious about this he, it's it's impressive and i've always said i think he'll do well on it eventually yeah, eventually I think he'll yeah. Do so he, well. he has bought a total of 4.7 billion dollars of bitcoin and that is currently worth 4.3 billion dollars of bitcoin david chase bank is banning crypto payments why what's going on um why i don't i don't know they just say that our policy around crypto is changing here's what it means for you if we think you're making a payment related to crypto assets we'll decline it but customers are free to use a different bank or provider to invest in crypto. That's called being wow. unbanked. You're wow. just wow. I got one of these letters from Bank of America one time with one of yeah. my accounts yeah, yeah. that just saw me transferring into Coinbase, and they sent me a letter and they said, "You're too risky. Bye." Right. They, they they say here's why they do it. Fraudsters are increasingly using crypto assets to steal large sums of money from people. We're committed to helping keep our customers' money safe and secure. So they're saying that like because people are losing money in crypto, that they're not going to let you buy crypto, which like. If it's the evidence is that yes, people are sadly being fished all the time. We are been talking about this. Does that mean that you just close down the gates to buying crypto? That's a reach. I also think that this is maybe Operation Choke Point hitting the UK. Mm. The same kind of effect here of big mm. banks saying no, we will. If you are dealing crypto, we will unbank you. Back right. to the Novogratz tweet earlier in this episode, right? Right. Um, yeah. Of you know. Of, of companies getting unbanked as a result of this. David, another Ethereum address was just added to the OFAC sanction list. This time, the Sinaloa cartel. This is a fentanyl trafficking operation in uh, a Colombian cartel leader, apparently. So added to the OFAC sanction list. I don't think that this is going to stop, by the way. Of course, you know, Bankless is no friend of um, drug cartels. Uh, you'll know that. Um, but it does set a bad precedent, I mm. think, if this is not handled correctly. This is actually a GitHub maintained by Ultrasound Money of all uh, addresses, Ethereum addresses that are on the OFAC sanction list. You see this? 21 of them. Yeah, 21 of them. Uh, 21 oh, there's Roman Seminov. Roman Seminov is on with here. eight addresses, wow. 21 entities have been added to the OFAC sanction list right now. And um, I don't know, I'm I like not a friend of drug cartels, but am worried about this blacklist Right. type of capability that growing the U.S. Scope. Is, is growing in scope. And I, I guess I have a few takes on this. One, I don't think we're going to get out of this. Like, I think mm. they're going to continue to add bad guys to this list, right? right. So that's going to be with us um, always. But I feel like we need to hold the line in some specific places. Mm. Like, one is they can't be sanctioning privacy smart contracts as they have with Tornado Cash, right? It's a right. general purpose privacy tool you can't add that to the OFAC sanction list. And I know we're, we're battling that in the court system right now. I'm also worried about uh, increased demands to AML, KYC, all of DeFi, all front ends, uh, and have them uh, essentially um, like have to check the OFAC sanction list before uh, they, can, they can serve up uh, you know, the, the DeFi in the, in the user interface and the application. So I'm worried about this, I guess I would yeah. say. I don't really have a solution other than there, there's got to be some places we hold the line here. Uh, and uh, yeah, I don't know if you have any wisdom for this, David. Do you ever think we'll see bankless.eth on there? Better not. Well, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing with our private keys, man? <laughs> Nothing, bro. They're coming for me. Well, it's I, it's fine when it's all bad guys on the list, I guess, right? right? So but that, that's the point I'm making. It's like, that's yeah. the point. Well, yeah. when, when, when does bankless narrative become enemy of the state? Well, there's are, there's already some people who, I mean, we, oh, I would certainly argue are not bad guys. Like a Tornado right. Cash is on this right. list. Roman yeah. Seminoff is on this list. Yeah. Open source privacy developer. Right. Eight eight addresses he has on this list, so yeah. that is not comforting. Um, yeah. David, we got a new wallet though. On to brighter news. What's this? New browser extension out of the Rainbow Wallet. Rainbow is uh, definitely a beloved wallet in the space. I would say uh, they it's been a mobile wallet. They've pi been pioneering mobile, but now they are now entering the world of being a wallet extension. Uh, I'm actually doing a show with uh, Mike from uh, Rainbow on Friday. He's a local local Williamsburg resident. 
Uh, but we will still we will still be doing it you know, over, over. Oh, you're not doing uh, it in person? Yeah, too, we got to, we have to do we have to do share screen. So oh, know, yeah. it's, it's a virtual product. He's got to show you some stuff. <laughs> yeah, I get yeah. it. Uh, how about raises of the week, David? What do we got? One raise from Bankless Ventures out of this week. Again, this is the way that we do this. Uh, whenever Bankless Ventures makes an investment, we talk about it here in the weekly roll-up as the inception of a conflict of interest so y'all can know about it. And it also gives us a moment to explain why we invested in the raise. Uh, the raise this week is Phoenix. Phoenix spelled with an F-F-H-E-N-I-X. Uh, this is <laughs> privacy. This is encryption and privacy <laughs> on the blockchain. Oh, cool. And we're, we're just leading the, the charge of investing in more of these things because there needs to be more privacy in, uh, on the... Uh, because there needs to be more privacy in the world of crypto. Uh, so there's a $7.5 million seed round uh, it's dedicated to bring fully amorphic encryption to a layer two on Ethereum and overall just pushing the frontier of FHE, fully homomorphic encryption, into the world of crypto. So this is, I, I think, stands in contrast to ZK cryptography, which is mm -hmm. you know, an, the more commonly known form of privacy. Um, interestingly, privacy and scalability are actually two sides of the same coin. Uh, so you get ZK rollups, which are hyperscalable, but you also get ZK ZK rollups like Aztec, which are private. This is a different strategy for producing um, privacy. Fully homomorphic encryption existed before crypto. Um, it's, a, it's just general cryptography, not cryptocurrency. Uh, but now we are imbuing it into a layer two for to have uh, fully encrypted data. So the way that ZK rollups work, or ZK in general, is that you generate a proof off chain and then you put the proof on chain and then everyone's like, yeah, that's the correct proof. It checks out. Fully hom homomorphic encryption operates differently. It's more just like um, the, the, all the data, all the state is parsable because all the, uh, all the state is present on chain. So it's a more rich state of data that's just encrypted. So you can run, you can run compute on it when it's in its encrypted form. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So you get, it's more composable because the state of things is all hosted locally on chain. It's all present and accounted for. It's just encrypted. Uh, and so more composability, more utility out of this kind of say a new approach, an alternative approach to the ZK space, uh, potentially more scalable. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. we need more privacy solutions specifically yes. on, on layer two. And, and last fun fact, you know, you know uh, this was founded by two guys. And I mean that literally. Damn it, I was going to give this joke. <laughs> I was like, well, that I was, front ran you, David. All of that stuff was interesting, but the real reason why we invested in this deal is because the two <laughs> co-founders are Guy and Guy. <laughs> it's just too good. Uh, if that's not bullish, I don't know what is. Uh, David, what do we bullish. have coming up next? Uh, coming up next, will ETFs push crypto values away? Are they coming to infiltrate and corrupt crypto? We'll talk about that. Also, our, another take, are we at the peak ignorance of crypto? Is, are we in the peak ignorance phase of the, of the market? I think huh. possible. Uh, and then also, is Ethereum a technology absorbing black hole? There is, I think, seven takes this week. It's a whole entire section of this regular roll-up. So roll good, up. though. So, so good. They're all so good. So big, big takes, big take section this, this week. Uh, so we're going to need to get to all of that and more. But first, a moment to talk about these fantastic sponsors that make the show possible. Mantle, formerly known as BitDAO, is the first DAO-led Web3 ecosystem, all built on top of Mantle's first core product, the Mantle Network, a brand new high-performance Ethereum Layer 2 built using the OP stack, but uses Eigenlayer's data availability solution instead of the expensive Ethereum Layer 1. Not only does this reduce Mantle Network's gas fees by 80%, but it also reduces gas fee volatility, providing a more stable foundation for Mantle's applications. The Mantle Treasury is one of the biggest DAO-owned treasuries, which is seeding an ecosystem of projects from all around the Web3 space for Mantle. Mantle already has sub-communities from around Web3 onboarded, like Game7 for Web3 Gaming, and Bybit for TVL and Liquidity and OnRamps. So if you want to build on the Mantle network, Mantle is offering a grants program that provides milestone-based funding to promising projects that help expand, secure, and decentralize Mantle. If you want to get started working with the first DAO-led Layer 2 ecosystem, check out Mantle at mantle.xyz and follow them on Twitter at 0xMantle. Arbitrum is accelerating the Web3 landscape with a suite of secure Ethereum scaling solutions. Hundreds of projects have already deployed on Arbitrum 1 with flourishing DeFi and NFT ecosystems. Arbitrum Nova is quickly becoming a Web3 gaming hub and social dApps like Reddit are also calling Arbitrum home. And now, Arbitrum Orbit allows you to use Arbitrum's secure scaling technology to build your own Layer 3, giving you access to interoperable, customizable permissions with dedicated throughput. Whether you are a developer, enterprise, or user, Arbitrum Orbit 
Orbit lets you take your project to new heights. All of these technologies leverage the security and decentralization of Ethereum and provide a builder experience that's intuitive, familiar, and fully EVM compatible. Faster transaction speeds and significantly lower gas fees. So visit Arbitrum.io where you can join the community, dive into the developer docs, bridge your assets, and start building your first app with Arbitrum. Experience Web3 development the way it was always meant to be. Secure, fast, cheap, and friction-free. Here's a question of the week from Bankless Citizen Kiwi Dog. When the Bitcoin and ETH ETFs are finally approved, are you worried that the wacky but value-oriented crypto culture, which I love so much, is going to be overrun by a rush of new people who have large amounts of power in the existing system? David, are all these TradFi people going to erode the crypto values that um, make us special, make, make this whole thing decentralized, make this whole thing uh, corruption resistant? Should we be worried about the ETFs from that perspective? Yeah, the, I actually wrote a blurb about this in one of my um, Davis Takes articles, The Last Crypto Cycle is Here, where I talked about um, Bitcoin ETFs and also uh, Bitcoin Ether ETFs and also running through uh, getting regulatory clarity. Like we are currently battling with regulators. We will get clarity one way or another. Eventually, Bitcoin and ETH ETFs will be approved. So there's this growing East of crypto, if you will, like mm. the civilized law abiding regulated uh, civilization of the east of crypto that is growing we are watching that grow um will there all will we be able to retain the freedom of the west i think by default absolutely because private keys are permissionless everything is a bearer asset the west is the default in the world of crypto the east has to be built so that is that actually an inverse in the historical corollary where like people show up in the east that they they're moving west to go away from britain and the, the monarchy and then they establish their own civilization but then keep people keep on going west because they're inherently looking for freedom always so as civilization is born they keep going west crypto is the wild west and it always has been and always will be because we have like freedom and private keys and power and responsibility and opportunity imbued into us by default. That is like the substrate that crypto exists upon. Um, will we? Will it be encroached? Well, with ETFs, people are buying Ether, Bitcoin through their ETFs, but they're staying in the trad world. That capital is staying trad. That's they're staying buying, in fidelity. They're also buying a worse product. Yes, and they're free to do that. And so actually the line between TradFi and DeFi will definitely be retained. DeFi will just be the permissionless version of finance. And all that ETFs do is actually wraps Ether, kind of, kind of like wrapped Ether, and then makes it composable inside of TradFi. But it actually is us. Imp We're corrupting Wall Street. They should be worried about us. <laughs> We're decentralizing them. Yeah, yeah I know. I, I totally agree. I think this whole thing is one big Trojan horse. And we, we got him. Yeah. Uh, yes. And I yeah, think yeah, yeah. that um, we've said this before, too. Um, you can't build something decentralized on something centralized, right? right? But it's fine if you put something centralized on something decentralized, so long as the base layer is preserved, right? And that, that's why we are so passionate about the layer one and mm -hmm. the layer zero, which is kind of the social community, keeping those layers decentralized, all right? Yeah. Our validator set matters so much, right? Yeah. Making sure that the entire block building, um, you know, searching, building, validating, supply like chain is corruption free and censorship resistant right that's the stuff that matters so who cares what they build that's centralized on top of those layers so long mm -hmm. as those layers remain decentralized yeah. and corruption resistant and quote unquote pure that's right. what we care the most about yeah. um i when with the ether etfs ether gets sucked up into tradfi eth price goes up yeah and they they add jet fuel to Thanks, the guys. values that power up crypto. Yep. Yeah. When they adopt crypto protocols, they adopt crypto values. Uh, let's turn that into a song. Uh, Chris Berninski, Eclipse is like a Solana embassy in Ethereum Nation. Hmm. Wow, just take from uh, Chris Berninski. What, give us some background on Eclipse right. first. Right. So Eclipse is the predicted outcome, I think, of the roll-up centric roadmap thesis, which is that new and alternative non-EVM execution environments can turn themselves into a layer two and settle on Ethereum and benefit from Ethereum's network effects and composability and liquidity and assets. Eclipse, we did the show not too long ago. Eclipse is Solana's Solana virtual machine as a layer two. And so Chris is putting this into nation state metaphors, which I so wholly appreciate. And he's saying Eclipse is like a Solana embassy on the Ethereum nation. So like a little domicile for Solana on Ethereum. Um, 
And he follows up and says, Eclipse will further trade relations between two of crypto's major economies, cementing the importance of ETH and Sol as a means of trade production and consumption. That is his take. <laughs> that is his that take. Is, that is Chris's take. I do yeah. agree with you. That is Chris's take. Yeah. Um, uh, you can see my take, my response to uh, Chris's oh, did take. did you say for, something? Yeah. Well, kind of. Uh, um, nom, I, nom, I, <laughs> I said, om nom, 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 nom. <laughs> Which is my version of saying Ethereum is just gobbling up Solana. So it's not it's not the Solana embassy coming to Ethereum. It's just Ethereum just absorbing it and digesting it. Well, that brings us to the next take, which is this one from not you, but swagtomist.eth. The beauty of Ethereum is that it's a technology absorbing black hole. EVMs, layer twos, optimistic rollups, ZK rollups, snarks, starks. SVM, that's the Solana virtual machine. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter. Everything ends up in Ethereum eventually. Ethereum's culture and draw is just too strong. And once you're caught up in it, there's no going back. back, back. So uh, embassy versus black hole, two different uh, analogies here mm -hmm. uh, for, mm -hmm. for something similar. Yeah, do you have anything yeah. to add to this? So this, this one is Swag's take, but it's also my take as well, because <laughs> I 100% uh, agree with this. I have my own version of this tweet all the way back in 2019. You yeah. can understand this from first principles. Open source uh, code aggregates. Better open source code depends on to better open source code. And Ethereum is a platform for open source code. So and we've seen this play out before. Do you remember uh, EOS turned into Loom Network? Well, neither of those ideas worked, so they mm -hmm. both just died. Mm -hmm. But um, Zcash, that's, that's Aztec on Ethereum as a layer two. Like we have that technology. Um, like uh, all of these things. Useful, Ethereum, useful open source cryptocurrency related code can just append onto Ethereum, and then Ethereum grows. I think so. I like, think, sure, sure, it's an embassy for now, but then it's just it's just going to get gobbled. Yeah, I think that the the black hole analogy is good. I would also use, just use the you know gra gravity, the the gravitational yeah. pull analogy is good, yeah. and I would use like a, a star or a sun type of mm -hmm. metaphor. If if mm -hmm. you are a, a layer one with a monetary unit and massive liquidity and massive economic bandwidth, right, uh, and a culture of innovation then you're just going to suck in all of the other stellar objects towards you, right? And they're going to start orbiting you, right? And so um, the goal, I, I mean, this is the bankless thesis, is to become the most massive right. star right. in your ecosystem. Yeah. Maybe there'll be yeah. a binary star system, though, David. That's mm -hmm. what, you know, that's what, uh, that's what some others would say. Bi binary star systems work when two equivalently sized stars about w within some range start like having a dance with each other. Mm. But if there's an imbalance between these two stars, one just gobbles up the other. Mm. Bitcoin and Ethereum, are the, is that a binary star system? That could, mm. though, I would currently call that a binary star system. Maybe we are stretching the metaphor too, too far. But this is uh, another take from Brenner. We told you we got a lot this week. Given the yeah. concept of soulmate, there's probably a similar build mate. Somebody, mm -hmm. someone where the two of you enjoy building or creating stuff together. The creations will be stellar and the two of you will have so much fun doing it. Oh, this mm -hmm. is a sweet one. Who put this yeah. in the agenda? A build mate. <laughs> Find your build, build mate. Build you got mate. your soul mate. Yeah, it reminds me of the bear market buddy take. Like, yeah. everything is just easier in crypto when you have a buddy. Find your yeah. build mate. This is, this is very heartwarming. This is a good time to find your fun, build mate, too. Fun fact, I went to college with Brenner. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. I feel uh -huh. like you always say that. Like, every show, it's just like some I went to college person. with someone. Yeah. You went to college, know, or you know this This is what happens next. when you go outside, Ryan. <laughs> Uh, all my friends are like virtual, so you know. So this take requires uh, some context. You know how we talk about um, blockchain fees are the taxes for the system, like the gas fees are the Ethereum taxes that you pay for the protocol. Yeah, they go to the public good of the protocol, right. which yeah, exactly. got it. F fits the pattern, right? But mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Membrane here, I think, provides an alternative perspective. He says, or they say, uh, a tax is dictated top down. An auction means pricing is set bottom up. In other words, if they didn't want to pay that price, the gas fee, that wouldn't be the price. The only reason the price is that is because people are, there are willing buyers. So when I think as we move forward and talk about, I think we will continue to talk about gas fees are the tax to Ethereum, but there's this important nuance that the taxes to Ethereum are determined by the market, not by a top-down, yeah, it's definitely heavy-handed system. A tax that's driven by market forces is exactly. how I would put it. Yes. Um, so, what, what, what's the context for this tweet, though? It looks like it's a uh, response I was to argue, a threat. I was arguing with Solana people about it's like uh, like high yeah. fees versus low yeah. fees kind of argument. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. uh -huh. got it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Vance Spencer tweet his second one of the episode. Wow, yeah. b b big week for Vance. Mm -hmm. It is now clear that there is going to be 10 to 100 restaking protocols and that the restaking game will increasingly become a hot ball of money. Why? 
it is unlikely that any one primitive data availability bridge oracle secured by restaked ETH will be able to meaningfully aug augment ETH layer one yield for the 23 million ETH and growing staked over a long period of time. Moving from one restaking protocol to another while their inflation is high will become the game. All right. Re let's take us to this corner of the universe here in crypto restaking. Okay. This is like eigen layer. Yep. R r help us recall. So restaking right. is first you stake it and then you restake it. And the reason you right. might restake it with a protocol like eigen layer is so that you can get some additional yield right. and put that capital at risk, in, yep. you know, uh, in exchange for performing some other and get some other function yep. and generate some other yield. So Vance mm -hmm. is saying that this is going to be a hot ball of money and a game mm -hmm. and there'll be many market participants. Yes. Yeah. So you remember how we were talking about all the friend tech clones that have spun up and forked out? Yes. How their Bitcoin fork and fair launch era, the ICO, food food farms in 2020. Like there's just this pattern in crypto of first you have this one thing and then you have the explosion of other things that are all kind of iterations on that. Um, the cool thing about Eigenlayer is that it's actually not just one thing. Uh, Eigenlayer data availability is one restaking chain. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but there's another Oracle chain, which is why the, the Oracle thing uh, is, is an example here. There's a bridge chain. There's many different use cases for Eigenlayer restaking networks. Mm -hmm. And so what he's saying is applying this phenomenon that we totally understand where there's, uh, as soon as one thing that's successful, you have the iterations and iterations. And then you also have like the liquidity locus, the mercenary the yield farmers of, of DeFi summer. Yeah. There's always going to be demand for the, a new restaking network because that's the pattern that Wait, we've so seen. Is he talking about there's going to be a ton of different eigenlayers, like restaking protocols, or a ton of different sort of um, eigenlayer networks, not eigenlayers. Ah, uh, I see. Yes. So different um, protocols. Right. That yeah, he's, not, he's not calling for a forking of eigenlayer. He's calling for just uh, a large supply of interested restaking capital that will produce demand for further restaking networks as the yields get sucked up by more and more people playing this game. Well, I think this clarifies it. So in his, his next tweet, he says, I think the winners here are the dominant ETH1 staking protocols. So that would be like right. a, a Lido, Lido or a Rocket, Rocket Pool. Pool. Yeah. And generally yeah. ETH itself. People will get more comfortable using it, withdraw more um, sex ETH to on-chain and continue bootstrapping the ETH monetary premium. Uh, uh, that, that has always been my thesis behind Eigenlayer is that this just shifts power, the pendulum from the alt, many alt layer one thesis to the ether is the capital of the internet. Yeah, idea. It, stre it strengthens the ETH is money thing and the Greatly. cold kind of monetary Greatly. game that all layer ones need yeah. to play. Um, yeah. David, are we at peak ignorance of crypto? That's what this next take says. What are we looking at? Yeah, so this is a Ken Dieter who tweets out uh, this uh, graphic, which I'll explain here in a second, and says, this is my mental model for comparing how crypto progresses through time to how people outside of crypto perceive that progress. Huh. So, we got, so we got two lines here. One is a kind of stair-steppy upwards and to the right green line. And so the stair steps... Uh, I think are uh, kind of happen inverse, inverted to the uh, market. So when there is a bull market, we hit a plateau because no one gets any fucking work done in a bull market because we're all gambling and, and it's raining money everywhere and everyone's distracted. And then this, that's the peak bull. And then in the peak bear is when you know work actually gets done, but everyone thinks that crypto is totally dead. And I actually appreciate this subtle nuance in this um, graphic that the what crypto can actually do line, the stair stepping up into the right line, is also accelerating because progress compounds. But meanwhile, what everyone thinks crypto can do is kind of sinusoiding, yeah. oscillating around what crypto can actually do. So, so the axes here are, it's over time, but it's capabilities over time, right? Mm -hmm. And so the green line signifies that what crypto can actually do is mm -hmm. greater capabilities over time. That's right. actually yeah. happening, right? And right. it happens in kind of like different waves as we unlock various things. Right. But what happens during bull markets is we overshoot the capabilities and we're like, it's the best always. thing ever. It's going to change everything. You just price that's forward going to the future. You totally do. And then what happens during the, the bear markets is we're like, it's doomed. It's over. You know, crypto is good for nothing. It's just a right. bunch of a Ponzi schemes and there's nothing that it's going to effect and we'll never go mainstream right and uh we're, we're at the would you say we're at peak bear right now oh it, yeah i think we're coming out of it actually like the, the what, whole what show of force do, from yeah what does that have to do with peak ignorance of crypto is he just saying like in the bear you are peak ignorant yeah like no none of your friends want to hear about the pudgy penguins in walmart right now 
So that's where we are in the cycles. Peak that's ignorance. That's where we are. That's where we are in the cycle. cycle. Yeah, that's right. Good, good that's name right. for Peak this episode. Peak ignorance. David, last take of the week. What's this one? Uh, this is such a good one. This is a deep cut for uh, the so both for long term and, and newer listeners who don't know about these dynamics. Coinfessions is a, a Twitter account that just tweets out um, like statements from people. It's, it's it's like a it's a meme account that tweets out statements from uh, anonymous people. Real uh, statements though. Re- real is statements it, that, that are say? submitted. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So the, the statement that was submitted to this Coinfession was: I was employed by a Bitcoin mining company to spread negative information about Ethereum on Twitter and 4chan for a duration of two years. <laughs> Now, if you are a veteran, you understand exactly who this company is. It's called Blockstream. Uh, they are the mining company. I mean, this is my take. This is my guess. I do not know this fact, but man, like, prove me wrong. Um, there, uh, here's another uh, bit of information. Um, my first boss in crypto uh, was a Bitcoin OG and converted to Ethereum in the ICO mania. Uh, and, but also just like disclose to the entire company that like him and a few of his Bitcoin whale owning friends financed the subversion campaign of Ethereum (laughs) from, from 2015, bro. He, and he just told us the whole entire company is like, yeah, we, we paid for like, we paid for like FUD. We paid for the FUD of Ethereum. Like the extra FUD on top of the DAO hack and Ethereum classic and all of these things. Right. Every time is, something negative went down, they just magnified it tenfold. Yes. Yeah. The, the Ethereum is centralized. You can't run a node. Like just fudding, fudding Ethereum just because that was that you could play that game. It was the, truly the Wild West back then. Um, and so the, this coin fashion is just like the, the Blockstream employed. They like you just look go look at Grubles if you remember Grubles. Samson Mao. Like if you want to listen to the most cringe piece of content ever, listen to Samson Mao from Blockstream and Vitalik Buterin on what Bitcoin did, and oh, oh my god, that, that was so bad. I can't believe Vitalik did that. Anyways, <sighs> these are the tactics that have existed and still exist, and I say I would say that I think that it's gone from Bitcoin, like it's left its scar on the Bitcoin culture. These tactics still exist. It yeah. still happens. This you is still an alive, and it's probably being, uh, it's probably higher up the market cap stack than you would think. You have to curate your news, like your sources of information yes. in this yeah. space, because there's yeah. so much bad information, like mm-hmm. out there, or disinformation, or, or, or uh, pure fud. It's no wonder it's so difficult to right. find your way in crypto, right? You People no who are relentlessly who on crypto Twitter pushing narratives all of the time, like that, you should proceed with caution. Unless they're podcasters, right, David? Unless they're podcasters, yeah. <laughs> Unless they're not us, we wouldn't do these things. Oh my God, we didn't even mention <laughs> BitBoys in jail right now. And that's, oh my that's God. fine, didn't yeah, even make the agenda. I didn't, yeah, I didn't want to. Anyway, do, moving on. Uh, David, what are you bullish on this week? Okay, uh, I attended, this, there's this rabbit hole that I know exists that I've been trying to go down. Okay. And I've gotten like nibbles of it. I went to a meetup in New York that was like 30 people. It kind of felt me, felt like the, Ethereum meetups of old where like, you know, folding chairs and like this basement basement kind of looking thing and everyone is there just because we're nerds looking at this stuff. What are you what are you nerding out about? This is uh, the the words that we have described are autonomous worlds. Um, this <laughs> is being pioneered by uh, Lattice, uh, Zero X Park guys, um, Mud. There, but there's a, just interest in Who this. Who are these people? Lattice, Mud? I, I don't think I've heard. Like very skunk worky people. Okay. Um, These are uh, individual Twitter accounts, or like yeah, like um, the Xerox Park guys are funded by grants, uh, so okay. they're they're just like the the develop developers developers. Okay. Um, Autonomous worlds. Uh, it's like crypto gaming, but not like the crypto gaming that you know. Um, fully as as much logic on chain as possible, and so you get unique properties about that. Ryan, I think everyone understands when I say NFT, they're like, uh, what's an NFT? It's like, oh, it's a CryptoPunk. It's a pudgy penguin. It's a collectible of some sort. It's a JPEG. Mm-hmm. And maybe maybe the team adds some like utility or access to that. Sure. That is. Or, or a plushy toy in Walmart. That Exactly. That is the Stone Age of what NFTs can be. <gasps> Inert objects, that yeah. is like the first iteration. Kind of like the Bitcoin is the Stone Age of crypto, my take. Yeah. Uh, Ethereum is like the sci-fi version of this. We are... We are in the Stone Age version of NFTs. What if I told you, Ryan, that an NFT could be a universe with specific laws of physics and specific types of property rights, internal property rights, and that universe is defined by an NFT and that NFT is transferable? One, I don't know entirely what you mean. Two, it sounds cool. Uh Three, do I actually want that? I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> I, I, with when universes can become like again 
with state internal state internal laws that are yeah. different from Ethereum and can have their own uh, their own internal logic, and that is a transferable object. I mean, we 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 talked about in our metaverse uh, episode. You know, what are NFTs? They're digital objects. You know what's an object? A whole entire universe, bro. It's, fun, it's, fun, it's funny you use the, the M word, the metaverse word, because that has so much fallen out of f- yeah, fashion Yeah, we don't use that word anymore. And it's, uh, uh, by the way, I th- crypto started using that word before Zuckerberg took it took it over. Big and time. then he, that was he co-opted our it and then he killed it. And it's, yeah. anyway, it's, de- it's dead, dead, dead now. But do you know that 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 statement of, of basically like everything that, um, you know, w- the, the bulls predicted about crypto will come true. It's just a matter yeah. of timing, right? Yes. And the same thing happened with the internet. I feel like that's very much true. Mm-hmm. And, and this is basically that concept. It's property rights, uh, digital property rights, autonomous worlds um, right. inside of like what you're talking about. Another word for autonomous worlds is like metaverse. It's what you yeah. used to kind of call it. And yes. are you saying you're seeing hints, right. you're seeing green shoots of like growth, new growth in this autonomous world? It's, it, how do I enter an autonomous world right now? Is, is there a game I play or like? Yeah, there, yeah, there is. Maybe you, you'll resonate with this metaphor. Mud is like this game engine that this the mud team are the are building this game called sky strife so that is the game that you actually see on screen hmm. um, built on mud and so they're kind of dog fooding their own game is this happening anytime soon no this is this like needs years of iteration and development like some of the more informed numbers i've gotten is like 3 plus years um, but there's a there there and it's kind of the, one of the big pills that i remember taking way back when when i realized that like yo you can put any alt logic on chain. We just need to figure out how to compress it and make it finish and make it uh, scalable. This is what this is what they're doing. They're like Oat Mud is putting is it's an on chain game universe engine, and people are trying to figure out how to make rich, vibrant, stateful universes inside of like things like an NFT. That's so cool. I I, I think it's cool, and yet I still don't fully like. I feel I like you need to it. experience yeah, it know. in order yeah, to understand yeah. it. I but. think the, the TLDR is, why, why am I bullish on this? It's just one of many things that I think, like, there is so much juice left in crypto to squeeze. Like, yeah. we are just tip, tip of the iceberg. We can't even imagine some of the future stuff. So you think we're going to sell all that this this cheap block space we're creating? Because I've been worried about that lately, yeah. David. we got real yeah, cheap no, block, like, block uh, space, but maybe autonomous worlds will, will buy it all up from us. Yeah. No, that's right. That's right. Ryan, what are you bullish on? I am bullish on what we were talking about earlier, crypto people showing up in DC and um, the good people this time. All right. Guess mm-hmm. who wasn't there, David? Uh, Sam Bankman Freed. Oh, yeah, right. All right. right? I mean, he, he was uh, in jail. And um, I think that crypto has been a little late to the party with respect to like participation in DC. Um, but it's here now. And uh, like some reasons it's been late to the party. I think most other industries would have been in DC lobbying from like day one and participating in the way that crypto is from day one, but crypto didn't. And I think part of it comes from this um, this core kind of libertarian governments are bad type of ethos. That's maybe one part of it. Another is I think there are some um, builders in the space who are a bit more techno utopian. We're basically like, we don't have to play the lobby games like you know the old tribe did. Uh, if we build it, they will come. We'll see it's a better system, they'll just adopt it, right? Um, and then there's another element of why we haven't participated. We just really didn't have the use cases. Like, what do you go to the U.S. government and be like, yeah, we're going to um, supplant the dollar with this new you know, cri- cryptocurrency. They're not going to act very favorably to that. But now we have stable coins, for instance. Now we have you know, like DeFi. Now we have the creator economy with NFTs. Um, but I think the realization crypto has had that if it doesn't show up in D.C., if the good guys don't go to D.C., someone else will. Someone like SBF. Right. right. He really revealed that there is a power vacuum to fill right. and that if you're ambitious, if you're crafty, if you're short termist, if you're organized, then you can go fill that that uh, vacuum with like political bribes to try to, you know, capture all of the, the entire regulatory apparatus and bend it to your will. Right. And so anyway, I'm bullish that SBF is out and some of the good guys are in and actually playing this game in a good way. And that we're getting organized, that exchanges are there, that our lawyers are on top of things, that our educators and lobbyists are there, that our builders like Kevin Owaki earlier in this episode showed up in D.C. And I still feel like we have a, a massively like a very long, long fight in the U.S. Um, you know, we got to fight the IRS. We got to fight the SEC, right. the CFTC, the entire past year, the roll up. We have been talking about regulatory way more than like I am comfortable. Like I hate talking about it every week. And yet that is the thing that we are fighting right now. Um, But I am bullish 
with with kind of this new wave of, of progress and our participation there and uh, channeling like we're just more aligned and organized than we ever have been. And uh, I think we'll make real progress in the U.S., even though it won't be easy. Yeah. And I'm reminded about, I think, my favorite line out of Permissionless, which was Hester Peirce's quote, which is that the courts are on our side. The law is on our side. We just have to show up. Yeah. And we haven't, we actually haven't right. seen. We haven't even showed up yet. Yeah. We haven't even seen what we can do when we show up. 100%. Yeah. So absolutely massive unlock. David, meme of the week. You ready for this? Meme of the week. Yep. Uh-huh. Uh, this is what a, are we looking at? This was a 100% convinced that Ryan Sean Adams put this meme together. <laughs> uh, the quote is, another unregistered securities exchange, absolutely disgusting. Like and the picture is what kids. looks like a uh, middle school Pokemon competition with a, <laughs> with a nice young lady in a Pokemon suit. Look, look at her trading her cards. Like look what's at her going on here. Violating securities laws. Absolutely. Lock these yeah. kids up. I, uh, I bet she's not even paying her taxes. <laughs> David, we got a moment of Zen this week that we just found prior to this episode. It's actually from a source you would not expect. I believe that source is Van Eck of all places. So yeah. we're going to play that moment of Zen in, in just a minute. Do you, you want to say anything to tee this up? Uh, Van Eck, very trad fi boomer capital. Uh, uncharacteristically Zoomer meme. That's all I'll say. <laughs> it's really good. It's really good. Uh, disclosures. We're going to end with risk in a minute, but first we disclose. Bankless Ventures, as we mentioned, is an investor in Phoenix. We talked about them earlier in the show. David and I are both advisors to Matter Labs as well, the ZK Sync project. And of course, David and I hold ETH. We are long-term investors. We're not journalists. We don't do paid content. There's always a link to all Bankless disclosures in the show notes. I'm going to end with this. You know, crypto is risky. You could get fished. You could lose what you put in, but we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on the bankless journey. Thanks a lot. Ethereum. Ethereum. Now in an ETF form. Coming soon. Follow us to stay informed on the release. Oh, and H-O-D-L or F-O-R-K-O-F-M.